Hello and welcome everybody to ALC at Home. This is our online service here at Abundant Life Church. I'm Lewis and this is Hannah and we're going to just take you through a few things, go through a few notices as we go into today's Sunday message. Yes. So we're excited for yes. it. Are you excited for it? So excited. Let's go. We first, we have so many things that we could um, talk to you all about, but the best way to find out more about us is through Linktree. Linktree is a platform we use to keep all of you updated on what's happening at ALC so that way you don't miss it even if we we do um, any up weekly updates, notices, um, any other links that you need to know for our social media. Everything is up there. And that's linktr.ee forward slash ALCNZ. So make sure you check that out so that you can keep up to date with us. Also, one thing that we have back now, as you've seen, we've, I think we've got three, yes. three or four videos yep. now, is we've got Slido. And if you don't know what Slido is, slido.com is a way you can go on and ask questions about life and faith. Yes. Um, you know, the, a recent question was about those people that knock on the doors and yeah. tell you about <laughs> Jesus, but they tell you about weird stuff about yes. Jesus. It's like, what are you talking about? How do you respond to those people? Um, so you can ask questions like that, and then mm. Pastor Hamish will answer them on our YouTube channel. So you can just see, go through our recent videos videos you'll see all these different videos and there's a lot of questions I encourage you to watch them be encouraged there's a lot of Q&A videos on our YouTube channel so you can go look for old ones yes but ask new ones and they'll be answered twice a week usually on Wednesday and Sundays yes. New Zealand time. so I encourage you to do that that's so good hey here at ALC we encourage you all that you know what we like to say here is that we want to be a community of hope not just for our city but beyond as well so that's for all of you watching from all over the world we want you to feel like you're a part of our community you're part of our family and one of the ways we like to um, you know ensure that and to make sure that you feel that way is through praying with one another um, you know here we walk alongside everyone in our congregation so we want to do that for you as well and so one way that we can be connected through prayer is through our email prayer at alc.org.nz this is a prayer line that you can use to email any prayer requests that are on your heart um, it can be about anything and we will pray with you there is a prayer team that looks into these that prays for everyone in our congregation and online as well so we really encourage that if there's something on your heart that you want to be prayed into email that to prayer at alc.org.nz and someone will be in touch with you that's awesome so we, we encourage you in this time to join us be a part with us as we go further and closer with god you know i'm excited yes. as we get into the message today we have ben finley he's mm. a good friend he grew up in the city of wellington he now lives in auckland he had this radical encounter with jesus and i was just hungry for so yeah. many to experience god's love and goodness he started an organization called catalyst which is being mm. a catalyst to help empower young people in the church yeah. to go and be all that God's called them to be and help reach others mostly with that whole focus on reaching others mm. and so it's awesome we have that opportunity to have him sh speak with us today but before we get into that we're going to go into a time of worship you know yes. so often we think worship means we have to jump up and dance and we'll sing songs or whatever but one thing worship is 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 a response it's a choice from us to listen to draw closer and to mm. surrender so we're going to do things differently as as you might have seen on our videos already um we don't we for our online service we love to have a time where we just listen to scripture yes and just listen to the word and just focus on who god is mm. through scripture so i encourage you join us as we do that today get a notebook out as we go into the message afterwards and let's get excited and expectant for mm. all god is doing let's do it together come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord our god maker for he is our god we are the people he watches over the flock under his care if only you would listen to his voice today Psalms 95, verse 11. Pray of our heart this morning that as we gather, that, that Lord, in everything about our lives, we reflect your grace and what you've done for us. As we learn to, to live for you and, and not by circumstance. So Holy Spirit, as we gather to worship, as we open up the scriptures together, continue to captivate us with all that you have for us, for our good and for your glory. Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. It's so good to have you with us. We are a community of hope for our city and beyond. We believe that because God is still holding all things in the palm of his hand, that life is worth living, that the Spirit of God is here, and Jesus invites us into a relationship with him. And that's why we gather, that's why we worship, that's how we live our lives. So it's good to have you with us. It's good to be here. 
Hey, thank you, team. It's always so good to worship. And thank yeah. you so much for what you've done this week, preparing yourself for this moment. Come on. Really yes. Um, and you know, I know there's another service, but I just want you to know that you may feel like Sunday comes around every seven days and it's a routine. Now. We need to take it for granted. I need to take it for granted. I really appreciate the way that you see the mind of God for our worship so that we are invited into the place of you for us. So thank you so much. Well, this morning we are taking a, a break from our series. We are going to conclude it next week on Becoming, where we're looking at what it means to live the lifestyle of Jesus. Because a really good friend who uh, is going to be speaking this morning, I've known um, Ben Finley for for a long time, uh, for about 20 years, mm-hmm. since he was about 14 or 15 years old. Uh, I've seen him uh, own his faith, grow up and own his faith, and step into the plans and purposes God has for him for this nation and beyond. And, and I personally believe that that uh, history is going to record Ben as one of the one of the significant people in our nation. I think he leads one of the most significant ministries in our nation at the moment. We have some incredible churches. We have some churches doing some great things, both small and large, uh, who are really seeking to advance God's kingdom. But Ben has put his hand up and said, Lord, I'm going to partner with you and bring your kingdom to bear and equipping people to for the Great Commission. And he is doing incredible work to reaching this, this generation in ways that, that many of us would struggle to. And he's not just winning them, but he's discipling them and equipping them to go and to do likewise and multiplying uh, so fast that it's exciting to hear the stories. And uh, there is a, a movement that is uh, called Catalyst that he's put together. They are doing some incredible things, some of the t- but uh, I'm going to welcome up Ben, and, well, and he's going to tell you a little bit about himself, introduce Jess, cool. and he is going to encourage us this morning. So, uh, yes, you know, just welcome. When I first met him, I was bigger than him. I just want to go on record. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Cool. Well, good morning, everyone, and such a privilege to be here. And, and uh, yeah, love Wellington, born and bred in Tawa, the promised land. So hopefully you'll all see the light and move there. Maybe this church could just sell up and buy a nice building in Tawa. You could probably get like 10 buildings in Tawa for what the price of this would be awesome. But no, such a joy to be here and, and to partner with you in worship. Man, it was so awesome. I walked in a little bit late. My four-year-old was having quite the morning, and uh, <laughs> he's pretty tired. Um, tired from me carrying him up Colonial Knob last yesterday, I guess. I don't know. But uh, he, uh, yeah, but just as soon as I walked in, could literally feel God's presence and was like, man, the authenticity here is here. Like God's here. Genuine worship is here. Genuine hunger is here. This isn't a church that's putting on a show. This is a church that truly wants God. And uh, it's awesome that, uh, you know, we get to just step into that as, as, as some, some people from out of town. So I'm going to, before we get into anything, I want to invite up Jessica Allen, who, uh, to give a little bit of context, is part of this, this crew called Catalyst, uh, and, and uh, Catalyst, we've been doing a tour now for, what, four weeks or something? Yeah. Well, not me. That's I've been good. sitting in Auckland having flat whites, but you guys. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. But no, but yeah, been about four weeks and yeah. hitting 70 towns and cities in total, yeah. which is incredible, working with local churches and youth groups and and uh, really revolve the whole plan around the hunger that's in the nation. And uh, so Jess has been on that tour since the beginning, and uh, I just want to honor you for your obedience as well. And so she has a story that she wants to share with us just to encourage us. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so I just want to share a quick story. So we're in Hamilton, and um, we're doing an outreach, like in any location. Gospel in my testimony. I'm just going to the gospel with you guys quickly now. I literally shared the gospel 
Wait a minute, I should help. God created like everything we see. God created you and I. He created us for like an eternal relationship with Him. For us to find our identity, our purpose, our significance, our hope, our joy, all in Him. But the problem is, Mom. we turn our backs on Him and we all make intentional, selfish decisions. And we're like, I don't need you, God. I want to live my own way. I don't want to live for you. And um, that causes separation from God, um, which isn't a which isn't a good thing. The consequence is like death, emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, on this earth, and also after we die, the punishment is hell. And I shared that with her. And then I shared how um, the good news is, is that God loves us so much that he came down as a man, Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross. He took on death. He took on hell for us so that we don't have to, um, so that we can experience life, life eternal, and restored um, into a right relationship with God. Through believing and following him. Things get forgiven. And um, so she was listening to me share the gospel. And then I asked her a question. I was like, do you believe in God? And she actually said to me, I actually met God when I was four years old. She shared how, it's crazy. I just see how she had a dream. And she, she said it wasn't like a normal dream. It was like, it felt like real as, like a real life situation. And in this dream, um, she was sitting on a park bench. And like this old white bed comes up to her and sits down on the park bench next to her and um and I know and she was like are you in the dream and he looks at her and says I am God and he walks on I was like hey is she lying but no I think God can get people through like funny things um and yeah she said how when God sat next to her on that park bench in that dream she felt this like immense like love like she knew that her human body couldn't make it up she said and so that was her encounter with god at four years old and i said like so you've met god at four years old do you like follow god do you believe in jesus have you been to church before and she said no i don't actually follow god um i don't really care about living a life of sin and i've only been to church twice and so i just reiterated her that like god really does want a relationship with her and um, that, you know, there's life found in following Jesus and explain the gospel again quickly to her. And um, so I asked her, I was like, okay, so, and that's how she had the gospel. She didn't have tears in her eyes the second time I shared, which is amazing. God was like touching her. That's what happens when you share the gospel. The gospel is the power of God and salvation. Like the Holy Spirit was touching her as I was sharing. So that's cool. Um, and I was like, yeah, do you want to make a decision to believe in God and like actually follow Jesus? Do you want to be forgiven of your sins, be made right with Go to heaven when you die. And actually, she, she was like, yes, with tears in her eyes. She was like, yes, I actually do want to change my lifestyle. I actually um, do want to be made right with God and have that relationship with God uh, that I had in that moment when I was 14 years old, I was no. 4 years old on that park bench. And um, so I simply just stopped to lead her in this prayer. She repeated it after me, um, and her voice was like trembling, and she genuinely like gave her heart to God, and Mom. she genuinely like, stepped into a relationship with God. So and, good. Um, she repented of her sin and now is bringing her family to church, which is awesome. Come on. The gospel really is powerful. <laughs> so good. So oh, yes. Awesome. Come on. Yeah, and there's there's just so many stories uh, like that, um, and it's not even just a catalyst thing. It's like what God's doing across the entire nation right now, and really willing to use anyone that's just going to say yes, young, old. Um, I don't know. You might have like two heads willing to use you it just doesn't matter if you're willing he will use you so uh, what we're seeing is that God is wanting to bring people to himself that hasn't stopped the mission statement of Jesus that he came to seek and to save and to save the lost um, it hasn't changed in the last 2,000 years and it's not changing till he comes back so it's such a joy to watch these guys amongst so many others going across the land um, and to really yeah just see and see for ourselves that oh my gosh there, there is faith in the body of Christ and there are people out there that are searching for Jesus. Some just, just don't know it yet. And as we share Jesus with them, they're like, oh, that's exactly what is stirring on the inside of me. I want, I want that God. I want that God that sent his only son for me. Um, so guys, just be encouraged that God's moving in Wellington. He's moving in our nation. Our nation is not too far gone. Uh, we're not post-Christian by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Victoria University is not post-Christian. Wellington is not post-Christian. It's all pre-revival and it's all pre-salvation. And there really is no such thing as post-Christian um, in history ever. So, uh, 
Yeah, so I'm just going to start by praying and then we're really going to get into a, a short little message on the Great Commission. Does that sound cool? Yeah. Yep, mean. So yeah, Jesus, we uh, want to invite you again into this place, God. We know you've been invited so many times um, to come this morning and we just want to say, God, would you come again in a fresh way, Lord. God, we know there's no such thing as just another Sunday morning, but every morning is significant. And God, you ordain that we would be here in this room today um, to gather around you, Jesus, to gather around the scriptures. So God, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. God, would you bring revelation? Would you um, stir us up, God, to be hungry for you afresh, God? Lord, we're, we're, we're thankful, but we're not satisfied. We're thankful with what you've done, but we're not satisfied yet, God. We, we long for more. We long to know you more. God, we want fresh bread today. And so, God, we just ask that you would speak to us, reveal to us what you want to reveal to us, and we're open to anything, God. So would you come with your joy, your love, your conviction, your peace, um, your hope, however you want to move this morning, God. We just give you full permission to come and do it in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Cool. So we're going to uh, talk briefly about the Great Commission and not get not share a whole lot of practicals on it, but more just kind of something that will hopefully inspire you, build some fresh faith, some fresh hope. I already feel like there's faith in this room today and that you're a bunch of faith and uh, it's awesome. Um, you know, no one forced you to stop this morning. Uh, no one had a gun to your head and said, you must go to church. And uh, so you're here out of hunger. You're here because I truly believe you want God and you truly believe that he can use your life for eternal impact. So um, what we're going to do is just go through a few scriptures, unpack them, and then we're going to get into some, some stories, and then we're just going to be just God's going to do something. Is that cool? Amen. All right. I'm excited. Hope you are. Hopefully you are too. I've only had one coffee too, and I'm this excited. It's good. All right. Matthew 28, 18 uh, says, Jesus came. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So that was Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20. And now we're going to flick, um, flick over to Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, which is uh, just my favorite. Honestly, it's my favorite verse if you're allowed to have one. Uh, it's, it's this in John 3, 16. So Matthew chapter 9, verse, uh, actually we'll read from verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest um, to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, just because it's so good. And Jesus called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. Come on, that's powerful. So here we have, uh, right at the end of Jesus' life, before he ascends to the right hand of the Father, he's gone through the cross, he's resurrected, he's appeared, I think it's to four or five hundred or so people. And uh, it's, it's very clear that Jesus has come back to life. And, then, but, and I guess a lot of people were probably expecting him to stick around a lot longer. I mean, he only died when he was 33. That's a pretty young age. I'm 35 now, which is crazy. Having a little midlife crisis, maybe. But Jesus was 33, and so everyone was probably expecting, here's the, here's the second half. Here's where the Messiah goes into boss mode, overthrows the, the Roman government and all of the, the beliefs that the Jewish people had about the Messiah. They probably thought this was it. He's come back now. He's going he's gonna to conquer and uh, all he does, though, is he appears to some people, teaches some people, does a few miracles, gathers his disciples together, and right before he, he, he goes up to heaven, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. That was one of the last things Jesus said to his disciples. And I just believe that his last commandment should be one of our first priorities. That he said this, and he didn't just say this to Peter, who was, you know, he was Jesus' one. He was the right hand of Jesus. He was the one that Jesus really invested into and, and uh, he was being raised up into obviously leadership. Jesus said this from Peter to Bartholomew. And no one who, who even knows what Bartholomew did. I don't even know. But Jesus said this to all of his disciples, regardless of their personality type, regardless of, 
of um, what they'd done previously, regardless of whether they'd stayed faithful to the cross or not. Jesus said this to every single one of his disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. And here we have, I believe, a key scripture to, to live that out as a lifestyle. You see, Great Commission, it's not about doing an outreach for an hour with a catalog team or going on a missions trip once a year to, to Thailand, although that's great as well. I mean, it's also obviously part of it. But the Great Commission is a lifestyle. We need to live this out as a lifestyle of making disciples. This is, and this isn't some heavy obligation. This is a joyful responsibility that all of us get. It is a joy, guys, to see people come to Christ. It is a joy to see people go from A to B. And it is a joy to be able to play a part, whether short or long term, to help someone grow in Christ-likeness, as, as was so greatly shared about today. It is a joy. But Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, I believe is a key for us to take and wrestle with with God. Where Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I truly believe that that is so relevant to Wellington. I believe it's relevant to your workplace. I believe it's relevant to maybe the hospital that you're working in. It's relevant to your immediate family, extended family, that the harvest is ripe and plentiful. But the problem is that there's no workers in the harvest. It's not a harvest issue, guys. It's a worker issue. Jesus is here saying that the problem isn't that that the people in front of them are too hard-hearted or too far gone. The problem is that there's actually not enough believers out there working in the harvest, making disciples, sharing the gospel, praying for the lost, leading people to Christ, helping people grow into Christ-like maturity. There's actually not enough believers doing the work. And that's the issue. But I believe that today we can change that. I believe today that we can say yes to our unique and creative missional call that God has for our lives and we can begin to figure out how do we do this great commission lifestyle that God's called us to. Is that cool? Yeah? Now you might be thinking, yeah, but Ben, that's awesome for you. You don't live in Wellington anymore. You don't know my family. You don't know my workplace. You don't know my university campus or my neighborhood. You don't know. You're not there, Ben. You're in Auckland and who knows what you do out there. But uh, guys, Jesus said this in a context that is very much, I believe, like the context is today. So when Jesus looked out at the crowd and had compassion for them and said that the harvest is ripe but the workers are few, Jesus was saying this, first of all, to over a, about a people that were heavily oppressed by the government. So the Roman government were heavily oppressing the Jewish people in so many different ways. It was cultural oppression, it was oppression financially, uh, through taxes, it was through so many different means, but the Roman government weren't exactly the most righteous of, of, of leaders of the nation. But the Jewish people were under them. So they were politically oppressed. It's estimated that around 65% of po people lived in poverty in Jesus' time, where people didn't know where their next meal was coming from. So they weren't just politically oppressed, they were living in a financial crisis. They didn't know, they were looking, walking past the petrol station going, oh my gosh, it's $3 a litre. What the heck? $6 for a lemon. What is going on? Jesus, come back. You know, I remember buying six lemons and paying $24 or something. It was crazy. Like, what the heck is going on? But uh, yeah, they were in a financial crisis as a nation. They, there was a lot of poverty, a lot of people not knowing, a lot of families not knowing where their next meal was coming from or how they were going to survive. Then on top of all that, guys, there was religious oppression. So the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious teachers of the time were heavily oppressing the Jewish people with religious burdens. So they would have to you know, pay so many ridiculous amounts of, self, of, of money or give crazy animal offerings and they had you know, the Sabbath laws in the day were ridiculous where they, they couldn't even like do anything and if they did anything they were under the judgment of God and the, the leaders of the religion of the Jewish people were oppressing them with heavy burdens. On top of that, <laughs> there was racial division in Jesus' time, which was so intense, where a Jew and a Samaritan wouldn't even be in the same room. A Jew and a Samaritan wouldn't even be on the same side of the road, which is why it was so radical for Jesus to, to go up to a, a Samaritan woman at a well and begin to interact with her. That was breaking down walls of racial division in Jesus' time. So we have so many different factors going on and more, 
But there were so many different things happening in the time of Jesus where it would have been so easy to look out at Israel and go, oh, you're done. <laughs> you're absolutely done. You know, you just, there's no hope for, for you. The, look, at, look at the state of the nation right now. Look at what's happened to you politically and, and uh, what's, what's going on financially with all of you and, and just this, this intense division that we're, we're experiencing even within our own people. Uh, with the zealots and other groups that are trying to cause these uprisings and these revolutions and all sorts of things. And it was chaotic times and it would have been easy to go, uh, yeah, you're done. Let's just, let's just hold on while the ship sinks and let's really just believe that, you know, at least I'm going to heaven. <laughs> at least I'm good. At least I'm making it. It would have been so easy to do that and to just settle. But Jesus looked out over that nation with all of that that's going on and he said, instead of too far gone, he said, the harvest is plentiful. What if our perspective shifted and if what if that was what all it took for us to begin to see a wild harvest in your own personal lives? A wild harvest in this church community specifically. A wild harvest in the, in the city and the nation. What if all it was was shifting from a little bit of unbelief to a little bit of a mustard seed of faith? And that was the first step that it took. What if we as a, as a family this morning decided we're going to kick this unbelief out of our lives over the harvest? And instead, we're going to put all of our eggs in the basket of Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to go, okay, the harvest is plentiful, but the work is a few. What if? You guys excited for that? I am. When my wife and I uh, were transitioning out of the community and the, the mission organization that we were a part of in Tauranga, you know, we were doing a lot of stuff in Asia. Uh, you've been to Thailand like six or seven times. And we were reaching unreached people groups, and, and it was, we were living the dream. Awesome church in Tauranga that we were a part of, and, and I had really good friendships and everything, and we had no intention of leaving what we were doing at all. Um, but then when God began to stir us that it was, it was time to, um, to transition, uh, we, we were like, okay, let's move to Thailand. So we actually started to make moves, moving to Chiang Mai, Thailand. We're like, let's just do this. We love the unreached. We love the fact that there are people out there that have never heard the name of Jesus and we get to introduce them to Jesus for the first time ever. That's powerful. That's fun. And as we're praying and believing and just going, okay, let's, let's, let's start making moves to move to Asia and, and do this, what God began stirring my wife and I personally was so left field for us. So like, nah, that's not right. But we, we heard God say to us so clearly, both of us as a couple, that God wants to do something so big in our tera. And he just invited us to be a part of it. He didn't force us. He said, do you, I'm going to do something so big here. Do you want to be a part of it? And we're like, okay, God, let's do that. So, so we just began to pray and fast and talk about, okay, like, what are we actually believing for in this nation? What is it that we feel like God wants to do? kept coming back to this scripture of Matthew chapter 9 verse 37 and at that time uh, in our lives you know we'd done a whole lot of ministry in high schools and a lot of evangelistic stuff and in the nation we'd done a lot of things and a few things in New Zealand that were great but we didn't quite see that fruit you know we didn't see that that impact that we were believing for and we didn't see the stuff we're like man this is you know we think God's going to do this and, and it didn't happen we didn't see it and we were hard-hearted, to be honest, we were a bit jaded against New Zealand. We're like, oh, we don't know, man. <laughs> this might be a, a judgment season or something. I don't know. We don't know what's going on here. But uh, as we began to wrestle with, okay, God, you want to do something big here? You're inviting us to be a part of it. The Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 kept coming to us. It would not go away. And what we're seeing now, four and a half years later, as we, as we launched this thing, this Catalyst thing, and really Catalyst is just a name, it's, it's, it's nothing special to be honest, but it's just something that God's doing in the nation is He's raising up Catalysts, which is all of you in the room. But four and a half years ago, we launched off the scripture that we feel like the harvest is ripe in New Zealand. We're a little bit hard-hearted and jaded, to be honest, if we're really honest, but we're just going to believe that this is right. We're just going to have simple faith in the Word of God, no matter what we've seen, no matter what we've experienced, no matter what disappointments or discouragements that we've seen in the past, we're going to rise up again one more time and go, okay, we believe. <laughs> so 
So what we're seeing now and what anyone will see that will just simply say yes to, to making disciples and reaching the lost, what we're seeing now is that it's no longer a faith statement, it's a reality. That the harvest truly is ripe in our nation, my friends. That the, the, the labor is truly our few. And so God is so, he's so logical at times. He's like, all right, ripe harvest, few laborers. I'm going to put pressure on my people through the Holy Spirit and through guys like Ben Finley and so many others to begin to activate believers into their call to reap a harvest. So you might be feeling a little bit of like, oh, Ben, can you just be quiet? <laughs> you might be feeling like yeah, a little bit of, oh, man, this is a bit uncomfortable or I'm feeling a bit too challenged this Sunday morning. I just wanted a nice sermon from Hamish Thompson on the Father Heart of God or something. Uh, just a little bit, you know, maybe a scripture about peace or uh, God wants to bless me financially. That'd be good too. Praise the Lord. But, uh, but I believe that God is, is putting out the challenge to the church of Aotearoa. And what he's saying is that, will you go? And he asked the same question in Isaiah chapter 6. And this is what we're going to, we're just going to land on this verse, guys. Because I think this is so, so key for us. So Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, to really, I think, oh, let's just read out verse 1 to verse 8, because I think the, the word of God is so good. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Can you imagine seeing that? Isn't that wouldn't that be amazing if you just randomly saw God on a throne? You know, we're all going to see it if you're saved in the room. We're all actually going to see God on his throne. That's crazy. Anyway, so God was high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above God stood the seraphim, which means burning ones. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their face. Two covered their feet. Two, they flew. One called to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. The seraphim touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. That's the gospel in a nutshell, my friends. That's, pretty, that's the gospel in a nutshell. Your sins are taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Verse 8. This is what I believe God is saying right now to all of us. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Or here I am. Here am I. Send me. God, I believe, is asking that question. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? The harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. Who, who will go? Who will go on my behalf? You know, God is completely sovereign. He's omnipotent. He will never lose. He's never lost. But he co-labors with us. He built the garden. He built the earth. He built the animals. But he said, Adam, take care of it. He even gave Adam the authority to name the animals. God is into co-laboring, guys. He's into co-working. And if we want to see a big harvest, we've got to be willing to co-work with God. Now, what I love about this, and this is really what I, where I want to land the plane, is that Isaiah's response to God's question was simply, here I am, send me. Now, Isaiah didn't have details. He didn't know where he was going or who he was going to or what he was going to say or how, how he was going to feed himself or where he was going to live. He knew absolutely zero details about the call that God had for him, except that God was sending him. But he didn't know anything. He didn't know any of the details. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know who he was going to talk to or how they were going to respond. But his response was, here am I, send me. Now we've got to ask the question, why was Isaiah's response so fully surrendered and sold out? It's because it came from that place of seeing God. It came from that place of knowing God. It came not from dry obligation, but from intimate overflow. And if we're going to see a great harvest and live the Great Commission, we've got to love Jesus first from the Great Commandment. He's got to be our first love with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that comes from knowing God's love for you. Not in a tick-the-box theological, I did Bible college 10 years ago way, and from a, in a daily experience. My four-year-old was wild to this morning, absolutely nuts. But before I left to come here, I gave him a kiss on the cheek, and I said, Daddy loves you, Asha. 
Why? Because I want my son to daily experience my love. How much more God? You know, John 3.16 is uh, a verse that probably all of us could recite you know, by heart. We're probably in our sleep. John chapter 3, verse 16. Well, I don't even know why I'm turning there. <laughs> Just on the phone, I don't know. Such a habit, right? But, uh, um, you know, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Man, when was the last time we wept over that verse? Have we thought about that scripture lately and gone, Oh my gosh, God, you loved the world so much. So much. He so loved the world so much that he gave his only son. Have you thought about that recently? That God actually gave his only son? I'm sure there's parents in the room. Uh, I'm a dad. You know, I have two boys. And forgive me for the intensity of this illustration, but imagine if someone broke into my home and they had a weapon of some sort and they, they said, I'm going to, um, to kill you or someone from your family who would it be? Who would it be? You guys can choose. Forgive me for the intensity of that. In a heartbeat, I would say me. Wouldn't have to pray about it. Wouldn't have to ring Hamish and go, Hamish, what do you think I do in this situation? <laughs> Wouldn't have to do any of that. Nothing. It would be an instant reaction as the father and as the husband take me. No matter, what, no matter how much pain it's going to cost me or cause me, no matter what it's going to look like, no matter what it is, take me in a heartbeat. I'd do it a million times over before I said, take Gideon or Asher or, or my wife. It would be me in a heartbeat. So for God to give his only son to the cross, it's so much easier for a dad to give their own life than to give their only son. So much easier. So this love that God has for us that caused him to give Jesus, it's incomprehensible, guys. It's unfathomable. There is just no way that we could ever plummet the depths of just how much God loves you and every single person out there. And there's no way that any of us could fully get the, the amount of cost and sacrifice that God paid to give his only son on the cross. This is crazy love, guys. This is unfathomable love. But the more we know his love for us, the more we're going to share it with others. You know, sharing Jesus with people, making disciples, it all comes from overflow. We all love to talk about what we love. Let's be real. I'm sure if I brought up nail polish with some of you guys, oh my gosh, nail polish, what? I'm sure if some of you might be the, the All Blacks or, uh, I don't know, fried chicken. For me, it's fried chicken. You know? We all love to talk about what we love, right? So I just want to, if I can challenge you with two things, three things this morning. Three takeaways. First thing is, would you, would you fall in love with Jesus again? And then it might just be for one person in the room. It might just be for myself. But would you fall in love with Jesus again? Would you come back to your first love? Would you, would you pray the prayer that David prayed after he'd been called out on his Bathsheba moment? God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Would we pray that prayer uh, when we go home today? Second thing is, would we wage war on unbelief in our lives? Where, And I, I've experienced this, guys. I know what it's like to believe that people are too far gone for, for God. I know what that's like. But would we, would we kick a little bit of unbelief and discouragement out of our lives and, and partner with faith going, Okay, God, Matthew 9.37, the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. And then the third thing I want to challenge you to do is would you pick three people, three names, Three names that don't know God. Three names that, that aren't saved. Three people that you know in your world that you can begin praying for every day. You can uh, bring them to church before the end of the year. And you can try and share the gospel with them yourself. All your testimony. Is that cool? Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine if one of those people came to Christ by the end of the year. That'd be like a revival. Churches around New Zealand would be studying this church going, what did ALC do? And so, oh, everyone just brought one person to the Lord. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so let's, we're going we're gonna to close on that. But um, if, uh, if you want prayer for anything, you know, we have these amazing guys over here inside and us. Hamish, if this is okay. But uh, 
But if you want prayer for anything that maybe God's nudged something in your heart or you just, you just want to go deeper or something, um, after we officially close the service, feel free to come to the front and we'll have one of these amazing guys uh, pray for you for breakthrough in your life. But I just want to close on a prayer and then I'm going to pass it back to Hamish. So, yeah, so Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you're so faithful and loving, God, to, to call us higher and to call us deeper. And we thank you, Lord, that there are many people in, in our city that are searching and are looking and are longing for a savior. Some just don't know it yet. So God, I pray that you would help us to see, first of all, see the harvest with compassion. Um, help us to see people through the lens of love. And God, as a family, we just want to repent of our unbelief, God, of, of partnering with a, with, with a spirit of unbelief and believing that that the city and this nation and the people in our lives are too far gone. God, would you help us to have fresh faith right now? Help us to leave this building with faith. Help us to leave believing God for the impossible and believing that you can use our lives to draw people to Jesus and to grow in Christ-like maturity. And Father, finally, I just want to pray, God, would you help restore us to our first love, God? Jesus, we just want to love you. God, I pray right now, would you fill us with fresh revelation of your love? fresh understanding of your love, fresh encounter with your love. Holy Spirit, Romans 5 says you pour the love of God into our hearts. God, we just want to say we're hungry for a fresh moment in your love right now. So Father, would you come and would you speak words of love into the hearts of every person in this room right now. We just thank you, God, for your goodness and we just love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Cool. Thank you guys for your time. I'm going to pass it over to someone. Thank you so much, Ben, for that empowering, encouraging message. And mm. let's be inspired. You know, what, what Ben's talking about is not just for certain people, it's for all of us. The Great yeah. Commission yeah. is a part of who we are. It's one of the main things Jesus has called us to do, yeah. to go forth and make disciples of all nations. And that's just not left to a few, but left to all. So I encourage you, let's get excited and expectant for all that is ahead. And I encourage you, God just wants to strengthen you this mm. week. But hey, shall we, do you want to pray yes. for us as we finish today? You know? Join me as we pray. Lord, we just thank you yet again for another opportunity to meet online. Lord, I thank you for every single person that has set aside time to watch today. I pray that you will bless them, that Lord, those who are watching that have come here to hear your word, who are wanting a fresh touch, will receive that, Lord. We thank you for the many people who this um, service has spoken to. Lord, we just pray testimonies over them, that they'll be able to share with others what they have learned today from today's word. And Lord, we just pray that for all of us, that as we've heard the message today, yeah. that Lord, we take that on um, into the rest of our weeks and, and Lord, into, into our into our own atmospheres that we have influence in, Lord, that we will live out of that word every day of our lives. So, Father, we just ask that you would have your way in us. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let's be encouraged and excited, yes. and let's go with hope for all that is to come. Have an incredible week, and we look forward to seeing you soon.